that is uh, going to affect it with this another layer which is added to this whole kind of situation in which we are. Um, <clears throat> so um, what I want to talk about is that, uh, you know, lockdown and its consequences, first of all, searching for meaning and means, sadhana, and this is the spiritual practices, meaning and means, and what is the philosophy behind sadhana, and then pathways to inner balance, some kind of, uh, you know, view from the Bhagavad Gita, as we know that Bhagavad Gita is the main text which we, um, which we take as our holy text. And this gives us um, ways of, uh, on the one hand, talking about, uh, you know, spirituality. Uh, uh, on the other hand, it is also about inner balance at, at the mental level. So this is also important to understand. And then meditation from the Yoga Sutra. So the idea here is that, first of all, we are going to think about lockdown and the consequences of lockdown in especially in in terms of our own individual being individual being and also of a relational world as it were so that we are looking at ourselves in a social dimension so the physical dimension the social dimension the personal dimension how are these all affected in terms of the lockdown and its consequences and also you know coming of the winter as well um, in the sense of searching for meaning and means, what does it really mean when we are in this kind of situation? How does it change, you know, fundamentally our ways of thinking about things? And how are we to then cope with a changed way of living and a changed meaning in our life? And bringing in the element of spirituality uh, to see what are the solutions which are available to us the philosophy of sadhana and in particular we're going to look at the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutra as, as, as um, you know means by which we can look at uh, sadhana and how we can uh, you know take it as a means of our um, of our coping with this situation. So first of all let's think about lockdown and its consequences. It has affect all aspects of our existence. Think about the physical aspect in the sense of this bodily embodied sense of being. There is obviously the direct threat of the virus, the COVID virus. And we are in a continuous kind of anxiety about who is going to get it and how they're going to get it. And, and the threat which is there in terms of life and death. And this is continuously going on. It is continuous stress which is created in the mind. And when we are at this level of our being, uh, not only our space is limited because we can't go out, we are locked within a certain space. We are locked within a certain way of being with our physical sense of being. And the virus is there and there is a continuous stress which is being experienced in the body itself. Then there is the personal aspect of it, negative psychological effect. And, uh, you know, because uh, I do some psychological counseling and psychotherapy as well, immediately the lockdown started. We began to see so many people who came with various different kinds of issues which erupted out of nowhere. And it is only because of this kind of, uh, you know, situation of the lockdown where people find themselves in isolation, they find themselves lonely, there is depression, there is anxiety, there's continuous stress which is going on. And these kind of negative psychological effects are seen throughout the world. It's not only in the UK, but wherever the lockdown is. In terms of the relational sense of self, here we come across social isolation. There are people who are living on their own without any kind of recourse to any kind of relationships, uh, physical presence of anybody. And this social isolation begins to function in the way, in a negative way, whereby ourselves are affected, our relationships are affected, there is violence and abuse going on because confined within a small space, relationships kind of come to a point of breakdown. Again, this is something which we have seen in the counseling center is that there is a lot of breakdown in terms of relationships as well. And spiritual, because we are not able to go to our community practices in the mandirs and, yeah. and wherever we are, 
it becomes very difficult then for us to, uh, to manage this uh, sp spiritual connection in our lives. Of course, you know, we can do our spiritual practices on our own, but there is a whole part of it which then misses out because of this lockdown. So, and there is a direct effect on the mental health. Mental health become worse during the period of lockdown restrictions and restrictions on seeing people, being able to go outside, worries about the health and of family and friends. And in a sense that it is affecting each and every aspect, like I was saying, of each and every dimension of our life. And because of this, these are the key factors which are driving poor mental health. And um, as far as the figures and the statistics are concerned, um, there are statistics which are available in for the UK, which shows that almost half the people are experiencing one kind of mental health issue or another, simply because of the lockdown. Uh, in the young people also, there is also problems with uh, young people managing to, to kind of uh, work through themselves through this uh, lockdown. And boredom has become a major problem for young people because at that age they want to be active they want to go out they want to have social relations friends and so on all that is restricted so here we got another problem as well then loneliness has been a key contributor to poor mental health and feelings of loneliness have made nearly two-thirds of the people uh, having this mental health worsen during the past month and past few months as well now with 18 to 24 year old most likely to see loneliness affect their mental health. So we can see physically, relationally, um, you know, personally, uh, spiritually, all are contributing towards an effect on the mind and the mental health, which is critical to our functioning and our efficacy uh, is beginning to be, uh, to be, I mean, it has affected our efficacy and our sense of well-being. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to look for ways in which to manage all these things. So if we look at the kind of fundamental change which has taken place in terms of our existential reality, call it existential reality because this is what our, uh, uh, it is affecting our sense of existence. The existential reality we were experiencing before March is not the same as we are experiencing now because some fundamental factors have changed in our life, in, a, in the way in which we are living, experiencing life. And then therefore it becomes, uh, you know, looking at what is that which has changed, a greatly increased sense of uncertainty. Uncertainty, even we don't know whether this new lockdown is going to last for only one month or it's going to last for another one year. Is it going to be on off, on off all the time? Uncertainty about that, uncertainty about our own uh, you know, physical well-being, about our relationships, about all these things, we have been thrown into a, a great deal of uncertainty because of this lockdown. Death at, at the doorstep. Death at the doorstep means that it is very much present. How? Because of the virus. We don't know where the virus is going to enter in our lives, how it is going to enter, when it is going to enter. And we have seen there is loss and there is enormous grief. And I've come across uh, you know, clients who are in a total state of shock because they have lost two parents within a space of two weeks. Imagine, within a space of two weeks, you lose two of the most significant people in your life. And all that is because of the lockdown and the virus. So loss and grief is uh, also experienced in an in a, in a, in intense way. Social isolation, loneliness, which is there because of the isolation. There are economic technological challenges which come about as, as, as a result of this lockdown as well. So in other words, there's kind of complete chaos in the sense of what we are experiencing before. This is now the new norm. The new norm is having this existential realities which have completely kind of changed of a way in which we think, in which we feel, in which we uh, kind of uh, transact in the world around us. This is a kind of complete change in terms of this reality which we, which we are facing now. And of course, there is the kind of 
personal challenges to freedom. How do we experience freedom and how do we experience, you know, the way in which we are kind of uh, looking at these challenges which uh, restrict our freedom, freedom. And uh, pour the meaning of life itself into a kind of chaotic situation. So we can see this, this has completely changed the way in which, uh, you know, we are experiencing uh, what we are experiencing now. Um, so, um, going further, what is the main effect is that there is an increase in stress. And we have to find ways of dealing with it. Stress means what? It is a response to a threatening situation. And of course, lockdown and, and the virus itself is a very much of a threat to all of us, individually, collectively, as a community, as a society. This threat is very much here now and in the present. And it is not something which is coming and, uh, and, and disappearing, and it is going to disappear. It is here for, for some time to come. And therefore, there is a continuous kind of stress which is on the body, on the mind. And as this stress kind of goes on and on and on, it has a, a tremendous effect on our health, physical health, mental health. And we have to find ways and ways of dealing with it. So what is stress? If we think about what, what stress is, is that it is a way in which we are looking at the, um, sorry, uh, a stress, a state of disharmony or a threat to the status quo. And we have seen this is really at the heart of it. Lockdown is a threat to our status quo and how we are kind of confronted with this existential reality, which uh, uh, at, at all dimensions of our life, it is threatening each and every aspect of our self. Uh, with the stress, we also experience physiological changes, increases in alertness, focus, energy, perceived demands may exceed the perceived resources. So the demands which are made to, to us, to each one of us in terms of the lockdown and the pressures which the lockdown is actually creating and how we are not having enough resources to deal with this kind of perceived uh, uh, threats which are uh, which are placed on us. Okay. Now, why I say it is perceived is just because each one of us perceives uh, demand and, and threats in a different way, because each one has, of us has got a certain sensitivity to demand, and also in a sense that we perceive our resources uh, as something which is uh, our capacity to deal with these demands. That is also a perception. And therefore, we respond to these threats in different ways. And therefore, not everybody is affected in the same way as, as each one of us uh, is experiencing this thing in different ways. So then what we need to think about, how are we dealing with the stress? The ability to maintain control, think rationally and problem solve. This is how we begin to cope with whatever is going on. And this is the threat which is coming to us through the lockdown and various things uh, affecting the various dimensions of our life. And what, again, another related concept is that resilience. Many people are more resilient than others. Some people are not at all resilient so that even a small amount of threat can throw them off the track. Whereas some people are extremely resilient. You throw them anywhere, they will quickly recover and thrive in spite of any kind of adversity. So how do we become more resilient? That's number one. And how are we to cope on a day-to-day -day basis with this stress which is coming out of this lockdown as the main consequence of uh, what we are experiencing, of the effects of this lockdown? So coping and resilience, how are we to increase our capacity for that? That, that really is the, uh, is the issue here. So we need to first of all recognize stress and I'm sure all of us know what, what it means to be under the uh, you know under the influence of stress and if we think about it that at the physical level 
there are some symptoms which you can easily recognize uh, as, as uh, clumsiness, headaches, illnesses, sleeplessness. Uh, our, our, our eating habits also change. Either we eat too much or we eat too less and, and so on and so on. Emotionally, mentally, all these things are there that we can begin to recognize. We have to recognize stress because it, it is going to have uh, an effect on uh, the way in which we feel about itself and how we respond to life. So recognizing stress is important. And in terms of the uh, various dimensions of our being, we can see it has an effect, uh, stress has an, has an effect on all these aspects of ourselves. So mind is the key element in coping with stress because it is in the mind that we are dealing with this stress at a mental level. And also in a sense that we are trying to think about how, how am I going to deal with this stress in this kind of way. It's all in the mind. Our experience of whatever is happening is in and through the mind. And it is all connected to all other aspects of our individual identity, sensation, perception, and even the deeper subliminal layers of the mind. Uh, these all affect because, you know, if we have gone through some kind of uh, previous experiences that begins to affect the way in which we respond to uh, the same kind of things in the present moment. It is a kind of conditioning which we have acquired through our past experiences. And all these aspects come together in the moment to define our experience is that all these aspects of the mind, identity, sensation, perception, deeper layers of the mind that come together to define the experience in the moment. And this experience is constantly, rapidly shifting, changing, modifying in very complex ways. And the nature and the function of the mind is at the heart of our spiritual practices. And this is important to understand because what we are thinking about is that lockdown, the effect on mind, mental health, and then Mind is at the heart of what we are experiencing. And then mind is also at the heart of our spiritual practices. So you can see the connection between what we are talking about in terms of lockdown and the, and the darkness ahead and how it is related eventually to what the mind is doing and how it is processing. Um, as a psychologist, I tend to kind of think very much about what is the process going on in the mind and how are we then uh, you know, experiencing ourselves through the mind in this kind of way and how this mind is actually at the heart of our spiritual practices as well so that we can begin to think about what are we to do with the mind and how are we to uh, put it in the context of coping on the one hand and also developing and cultivating resilience through our spiritual practices. So, Let's go to the next thing about meaning. Why is meaning important? So if you think about, we make meaning in our lives. Actually, we are always making some kind of meaning out of whatever we are experiencing one way or the other. And we kind of ask ourselves, what is the most significant thing in my life? If I tell you, tell me three things which are the most significant things in your life, that gives me a clue. That gives me an idea as to what meaning you are making out of your life. And uh, related to that, what do I value in my life? What is the most valuable thing in my life? If I say the bank account or the money in the bank is my most valuable thing, I know that the meaning you've given to your life is maybe that you're thinking that material wealth gives meaning to my life, okay? So what is significant, what is of value gives a certain uh, sense of what whatever meaning is. So we can think of meaning as being defined in various different ways, but one of them is about belonging. Relationships, bonds defined by mutual care, somehow we can say that is the most significant thing in my life. This is what I value the most, my relationship to other people. Okay? And we can think about purpose. What is the purpose towards which I'm working uh, to words, whether it is conscious or unconscious, is it material wealth? It is, is it personal wealth? Is it indeed even spiritual wealth? So I'm putting effort and making choices according to a certain purpose. That also gives me a clue as to what I have taken to be the meaning of my life. Storytelling. This is another way in which makes sense of the world and what is happening around me and in the world and making and 
making this uh, uh, sense through storytelling is one way in which we can begin to see what is the meaning of my life and how do I create my own story about my life and the life of others as well. And finally, transcendence. This also has got a significant way in which we can think about the meaning of our life, looking and being beyond myself and the world is a way of saying to myself, there is something beyond my life. There is something beyond what I've experienced. And I want to turn towards that because that gives me the most meaning in my life. So we can see that there are various ways in which we make meaning. And there are things which we find significant in our life, which we value in our life. And each one of us, if I ask you that question, what is the meaning of your life? You will be able to come up with something to indicate that, yeah, this is how I make meaning in my life. What we need to think about is that religion and spirituality gives us a kind of package. It gives us a way of making meaning in our life. Now, why am I talking about meaning and meaning in life is because we are trying to think about how can spirituality, religion support me in this lockdown situation? How can it support me in the coming days? Uh, and how that has to do with a certain way of being in the world and having a certain meaning in my life. And this is provided to me by religion and spirituality. It gives me a way of making meaning in my life. And we can use it to kind of understand human existence and human suffering. And if we see that, you know, the religions of the world, whether you take Christianity or Islam or, 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 or Judaism or any other religion, they are dealing with this uh, central issue of human existence, which is suffering. Why is it that we suffer and how is it that we suffer and what can we do about this suffering, which is, uh, which is constantly there in, in, in our lives? And in this case of the lockdown, of course, the suffering has increased even more. It can provide a system of values that one can live by so that our um, confusions which come about because I don't know what to do. Okay, just like in Bhagavad Gita, Arjun is completely confused as to what he needs to do. So it can provide a system of values within which I can function, I can make choices, reduces my uh, confusion and reduces my anxiety. It can also provide a clear basis for choice and action in the world. Why? Because if I know the values which are important to me and I want to live according to those values, then the choices will be guided according to those values. And religion, spirituality has got a way in which it gives us this uh, system of values and how to go about making those choices. It can also provide ways of coping with life and suffering. So coping, Parkman, uh, uh, who is a, a, a psychologist of religion, uh, he says that coping is continually changing the process through which individuals try to understand and deal with significant personal or situational demands in their lives. So coping means that here's a process which I undertake uh, to understand and to deal with demands which are made in my personal and situational life. In this case of the lockdown, of course, there is a huge pressure a huge situational demand and a personal demand on my life. And therefore I need to be continually thinking about what is the process which is going on and how can I change this process in order to cope with life. And, and what religion and spirituality gives me is a way of coping with life and suffering. So again, uh, you know, Pargamon says that he can identify five factors which serve at multiple ways of coping. Religion provides a meaning of life, just as we were talking about before. Secondly, it gives me mastery and control over myself and the world. <clears throat> In a sense that I can control certain aspects of myself, which gives rise to this mastery and control, which allows me to cope in a much better way. Um, not only that, but anxiety can be reduced through spiritual practice. And I'm sure that any one of us who has tried just sitting down quietly and doing some kind of chanting in our mind 
immediately we begin to see the effect of that on the mind. Okay? So not only does it allow me to have mastery over myself and my senses and my mind and my intellect, but also it gives me a sense of comfort in its practice and in its belief and in its attitude. This comfort can come through many different dimensions of my religious practice. Intimacy. There is a closeness to God and people. Okay? It uh, gives me a way of coping with uh, the threats and, and the situations which arise, which make me to have this closeness to God and people. Of course, this is now being threatened because we are in a sense of isolation. So as much as we are in isolation from other people, our closeness to God can provide a way in which we can be able to cope with whatever is going on. Life transformation, transformation of life to new significance derived from religion. This can be a fundamentally change our way in which we think and which we live and which we experience things that can change fundamentally through the adoption of various different beliefs and attitudes and practices in which religion provides me. So it is uh, uh, a way of thinking about uh, religion and spirituality, giving me a way in which I can cope with life and to be bit, uh, better able to handle whatever the threats are, whatever the situations are, which are placing this huge demand on me. Okay, further he says there are three main styles of coping, religious coping, self-directed coping, which acknowledges that the presence of the sacred, but relies on oneself rather than God to deal with the problem. In other words, the, there is a connection with the, uh, with the presence of the sacred, but the reliance is more on myself rather than God to deal with the problem. Then he says that there is another way to deal with that. Deferred coping where responsibility is deferred to God. And sometimes we talk about, you know, surrender and acceptance and uh, God will look after me and God has promised me that he's going to look after what I don't have and what I have he's going to protect. Just like uh, Krishna tells Arjun in, 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 in chapter number nine. Uh, so this is called deferred coping where responsibility is deferred to God. There is also another style, another collaborative style where there is an active partnership between God and myself. Now, these are various different ways of thinking about, you know, how uh, the different styles of religious coping are available to us. And it doesn't mean that we are going to follow any of these um, uh, individually. We can also have two different uh, styles. We can kind of combine and we can see that it, it can work uh, in combination as well. But really speaking to think about you know what are these styles of religious coping so that when we come to understanding the religious basis of our coping then we can see what is my relationship to god and how can it help me in the best way possible really that is the that is the question so um, professor radha krishnan indian philosopher he is um, said that the essence of religion is the immediate experience of the divine so if we think in terms of you know the the uh, Hindu way of uh, thinking about uh, about uh, religion, it is also in a sense to do with the experience of the divine, and not a kind of distant something otherworldly, but here and now, immediate experience of the divine, and such experience are the basis for inner transformation. As much as the uh, connection with divine provides me with the experience of the divine, it becomes a basis for my inner transformation. What we call the epiphany. In other words, uh, having the experience of God or divine here and now in my life as a real experience in the totality of my being. And that becomes the basis for a complete inner transformation. And this transformation itself is a shift in a consciousness. It's a paradigm shift. It changes the very basis on which we are living our life. And it changes not only the basis, but also in a sense of our identity and our experience as well, so that we begin to see ourselves as something other than what we were looking at before. And this change in meaning begins to be experienced with commitment to a spiritual life. 
So here's a kind of way in which we now look at religion and spirituality and say, what does it really uh, mean and how does it provide me with its basis for inner change? And the means of turning towards God or God orientation is the beginning of the process. This is called sadhana. Sadhana, I will explain what it is, but really this is the turning towards God. God has been accepted in my life. I am now relating to God in a certain way. I'm turning to God and this God orientation is about the uh, about my practice at all different levels of my being, where it provides me a way of turning towards God in, in this kind of way. So let's now think about sadhana, because really that is the that is the uh, the key aspect of our of our religion and religious practice is to think about what does it mean. So the meaning of sadhana itself, that by which something is performed and it is a means to an end. So uh, in other words, it is like a technique. It is something of a practice. This is the practical aspect of our uh, spirituality. So think of uh, spirituality as, as consisting of two kind of aspects. One is the philosophical aspect and the other one is the practical aspects. So theory and practice. And uh, what it means is this part of the practice, we can kind of put it together and say, this is called sadhana. It is a means to an end. It is something which we are practicing, which will bring about a certain end in our, in our kind of journey, as it were, the spiritual journey. And it is an essential preliminary discipline that leads to the attainment of the spiritual experience and takes me to the highest good or siddhi, attainment and perfection. So sadhana, sadhak and siddhi. Sadhana is the technique, sadhak is the performer of those techniques and siddhi is the attainment of the end goal. Okay? So these are the ways in which we then begin to practice and this includes all the religious practices, the rituals that are helpful to me of the realization of this spiritual experience. Remember, the essence of religion is really this experience of the divine and this realization of the spiritual experience, whatever way we can think about it, is really going to come from the religious practices and, and the rituals. This is the practical side of religion. Now, we can think in terms of organized religion is that going to the mandir or going to the temple or going to the gurudwara uh, and, and going to the church, all these are kind of, uh, you know, community way of organized religion, or it can be a personal way of dealing with our religious life. Both are, of course, uh, you know, external, internal, whatever they are, but they are the practical side of religion. And many precepts and pra practices are given in the scriptures, in all the scriptures. And, uh, you know, it, it is clear that what we have to do and how we have to do it. So the different approaches to the divine, the truth, each of the six major schools of Hindu philosophy has got its own perspective on the truth, the world and the individual. So what we say, Jiva, Jagat and Jagdishwara, the three J's of our entirety of our, uh, of our life experience. And uh, as, as I've, I've talked about the six major schools of Hindu philosophy, and I'm sure this is available also. Uh, and, and each one of them has got a, a kind of perspective on what is truth, what is the world, what is the individual. And each one has a philosophy and a practice which is associated with its perspective. For example, in the yoga tradition, we talk about some yoga, which is the kind of conjunction between the Purusha and the Prakriti as the basis of our material and sentient uh, identity. And the method of yoga is to separate each one of these principles of reality to reach the state of liberation, the state of Kaivalya, through a very deep um, uh, practice of absorption, samadhi. I'll mention that later on. But really speaking, you know, this is an example of how each one of the tradition talk about, uh, you know, the idea of liberation, the idea of the individual, the world, the divine, uh, and there are many different perspectives to that as well. But in a sense that all the practices are based on the attainment of a lived experience of the truth of the divine, and the beliefs and the values can be accepted, although these need to be lived. It's not that we accept the values and the beliefs and say, okay, yes, I accept there is God, but does God make difference in your life? That is the main thing which we need to think about is that 
there is a kind of uh, 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 a translation of beliefs and values in our lived experience and how is that going to function and how is that going to be transformed. And this lived experience of the truth is by means of sadhana. This is a systematic way of employing all the faculties, mind, feelings, choice, actions. It is a life of dharma, which we can say is how I'm going to translate my beliefs and values into a lived experience. And it is through this experience that the purpose of human life is fulfilled. If we can think of moksha as the ultimate purpose of, of the Hindu life, then that moksha is going to come through my sadhana. It is come, going to come through the orientation towards God and practicing in such a way that all my faculties are employed and I'm moving towards the uh, uh, ultimate purpose of my human existence. Okay, so <clears throat> this journey of the individual can be summarized in one of the most ancient prayers in, in the Hindu tradition. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. What does it mean? Take me from untruth to the truth. Take me from darkness to light. Take me from mortality to immortality. And think of this as a kind of journey from of a state of ignorance to the state of enlightenment. From the untruth to the truth, from the darkness to the light, from the mortality to the immortality. And especially if you think about the coming darkness, think about how this is going to be enlightened by the way in which we kind of connect with our spiritual or religious life. So this is kind of very broadly speaking, this is a journey which is to be undertaken. And uh, it is through sadhana that one passes from one state to the other, from disharmony to harmony, from disintegration to integration, from multiplicity, diversity to a unity of vision. This is what sadhana will provide me. And this is how the state of the mind that comes into a state of harmony and peace. Now remember that we started talking about lockdown and how lockdown is creating this stress in the mind, agitation, constant stress, anxiety, worry, depression, all these things are coming in the mind. And here, what sadhana is going to give me is a state of harmony and peace. In other words, it is offering a solution to this intense uh, distress which is created by the situation in which we are. And it is going to give us the state of harmony and peace. So what is experienced by the sadhak? So if we go specifically to what, uh, you know, for example, the Bhagavad Gita is saying, it is going to give us Tantim Nirvana Parma, supreme peace. This is in chapter number six, um, uh, verse number 15. Sukham Uttamam, highest peace. Nirdosham Samam, perfect harmony. Sthira Buddhi, self-composure. Anta Sukham, Anta Rama, Anta Jyotihi. Inner peace, joy, illumination. See how what I've been talking about, this dealing with this situation lockdown, dealing with the stress which is being created and what is experienced by the sadhak when he is engaged with the practice of this, um, uh, the, the practices which are prescribed, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita. And this is what uh, Bhagavan Krishna says, this is what you're going to get. If you are willing to practice, then this is what can be experienced by the one who is the practitioner of all this, uh, uh, these precepts which are given in, 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 in the scriptures. So these experience of balance and harmony are available following the cultivation of the sattvic guna through sadhana. Now sattvic guna, as we know that uh, we think in terms of the three gunas and the three gunas are uh, the sattvic and the rajasic and the tamasic and sadhana is turning our attention or our uh, inner transformation towards the sattvic guna, and that gives us the balance and the harmony. So what we are experiencing, in fact, is because the inner texture of the mind has changed because of our, of our spiritual practice. So going further into the kind of specific ways in the Bhagavad Gita talks about the practices. Remember, the practices are what is, are going to give us the coping ability, the mechanism for coping in this lockdown, and also to build up our resilience. 
the inner strength which is going to come through the practice of some of these things which are given to us. Well, Bhagavad Gita has got a very systematic uh, exposition of practical ways of living our lives so that we can get the benefit which I just mentioned. And uh, in a sense that it is a complete prescription, a holistic prescription of living a life so that not only are we able to cope with life, but also cultivate this huge resilience uh, in our lives through this kind of practice. So the teaching, uh, of course, the Bhagavad Gita is a teaching of the divine teacher Krishna to the human disciple Arjun. Now think of Arjun as you and me and Krishna as the divine teacher who is taking us through this process of thinking and practice so that this coping and resilience begins to arrive in our life. And remember that Arjun was in lockdown himself. He was in a mental lockdown in the sense that he was experiencing this crisis right in the middle of the battlefield as he sees his kit and kin across the battlefield, his elders and his teachers, and he goes into a state of dysfunctionality. He becomes paralyzed in terms of what to do. And this is what he's asking uh, Krishna. He says, tell me what to do because I'm totally confused. I don't know what to do now. He's in a state of extreme anxiety, projected as pity and grief towards uh, the kit and kin and his power of discrimination his rationality has been overpowered by this kind of pity and grief, and he has lost his morale. And although he may have wanted victory in his uh, kingdom, because this is the fight about the kingdom, he is overcome by anguish, which shatters his mental balance, his hopes, and his ambitions. Now think about lockdown. Some of these things are absolutely relevant to what Arjun is experiencing, and, and therefore it becomes even more relevant that you know, Bhagavad Gita is giving him a solution and therefore giving uh, a, a solution to all of us in a sense that you know, this is available to us if we are willing to engage with it. And this anguish is a state of anxiety and confusion when making a choice. And this is what Arjun is experiencing in the middle of the battlefield, being one of the greatest warriors of his time. He's still experiencing this kind of anguish. So Arjun says, my mind is overpowered by taint of emotion, my intellect is confused as to the duty and the choice and action. Tell me decisively what is good for me. Instruct me who have taken refuge in thee. And Bhagavan Krishna then guides him through the precepts and the practice of Vedanta, of the, of the spirituality of religion, so that he recovers from this condition, becomes balanced and in harmony, and is now ready to fight. So can you see that he has uh, got this uh, resilience through understanding, through the practice, which is given in, in a sense, okay, we are talking about 18 chapters of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, but in a sense that it provides this holistic uh, solution to the problem of suffering, of anxiety, of this grief, uh, which is uh, very much present in, in this condition of lockdown. And at the heart of our sadhana is abhyas practice and vairagya detachment. And this is in answer to uh, Arjun's question about the mind. He says, the mind is very fickle. How can I control it? What can I do? And uh, Krishna says, okay, uh, what you need to do is two things. One is abhyas, the other one is vairagya. Vairagya is a detachment. Uh, of course, this requires a lot of explanation as well, but uh, you know, in a general sense, this is what we can think of sadhana, at the heart of sadhana is actually about practice and detachment. So just briefly to kind of look at the sadhana, the logic of the sadhana. So what the approach of the Bhagavad Gita is reframing of existence. You know, I was talking about the meaning and purpose and values of life. Now this is kind of reframing our existence in a, in a different way from a spiritual dimension. This is now being kind of talked about in this way that how do I think of myself? Personal identity. It deals with personal identity and fundamentally changes of a sense of existence. I'm not who I think I am. I'm a spiritual being in essence. And this creation, the world appears to have inert uh, and sentient beings in it, but it is the manifestation of the divine. And the divine is ever present in both his transcendental and imminent realities. Now, this is called the reframing of existence. And, and uh, the first thing which uh, you know, Krishna does in, in the Bhagavad Gita is to change the very framework within which 
Arjun is thinking about his situation and his life. And we think about lockdown. How can we reframe this situation in which we are according to the way in which is described in the Bhagavad Gita and how it can kind of give us a way of coping and uh, to deal with life. So the grief and su suffering we experience is because of ignorance of the realities of identity, the world and the world. So <clears throat> ignorance or avidya is at the heart of this kind of uh, condition in which we don't recognize who we are, we don't recognize the world as divinity, and we don't acknowledge the uh, presence uh, imminent or transcendental of God. And as we come into the reality of God through sadhana, suffering diminishes and we experience peace and harmony within ourselves. So going further, in order to manage reduce suffering, one has to change the belief, attitude and action to align with a new way of thinking and reframing in the way in which, uh, you know, it kind of presents the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I'm a spiritual being in an embodied form. My purpose is to discover my true spiritual identity and I need to cultivate this through appropriate practices, sadhana, choices, values, beliefs, attitudes that are aligned to this new way of thinking about life and the meaning of it. So this is the logic of sadhana. Why do I engage in any kind of practices within this broader framework? We have to think about this is what it means uh, when I practice anything in my in my spiritual life. So the crisis of Arjuna in the middle of the battlefield, he refuses to fight. And the advice of Lord Krishna is what? Do not grieve as you are not this physical entity, but the eternal Brahman. In order to go beyond suffering, the purpose is to liberate from samsara, which is the cycle of birth and death. And this is done by realization of your true nature, your connection with divinity, whether you call it I'm part of the whole, whether you say I am a spark, divine spark is within me, or whether you say I'm one with Brahman, whichever Vedantic perspective you take, it is about the realization of that particular divinity. And the starting point of all this, according to the Bhagavad Gita, is Karma Yoga, selfless service for inner purification. And this inner purification is about reducing our sense of this ego identity and our attachments to the various things in our life. This is how the Bhagavad Gita actually describes it. And the divine is to be known in both his manifest and unmanifest form through the devotion, the path of bhakti, and purification comes through discipline of the mind and the senses with the knowledge of the divine. This is the path of knowledge. So we've seen path of karma yoga, path of bhakti yoga. This is the path of knowledge, jnana yoga. And then once your mind has become purified, you are ready for meditation. And through meditation, you reach the realization, and discover your true identity, and then obtain release from suffering and samsara once and for all through the path of dhyana, uh, ashtanga yoga, which comes in chapter number six of the Bhagavad Gita. So a systematic way of developing uh, all aspects of our life, the transactional life in terms of karma yoga, the heart in terms of bhakti, uh, the intellect in terms of knowledge, and having all this then going into a deep state of meditation, uh, which then begins to kind of form or give us a fundamental transformation within. This is now what Bhagavad Gita uh, is telling us. And the two principles of Karma Yoga, I'm sure you're familiar with, living a life of Dharma according to the station and stage of life, dedicating all actions to God, mind control, right intention, right attitude, detached from the result of action, whatever comes as a result of this dedicated action, uh, action, accept it as prasadam or the grace of the Lord and let it not create any agitation in the mind. So two principles of Karma Yoga. Now to remember <coughs> that what we are talking about is here, the practices which are going to help us, practices which are going to help us to, uh, to, to cope and to become more resilient. Think about how one can actually begin to do this. And uh, Karma Yoga, uh, what Bhagwan says is that renouncing all actions in me with the mind centered on me, free from hope and egoism and free from mental fe fever, perform your actions. Now, this is a, what I call the five point plan of Karma Yoga. And this is what we can do in terms of coping with life. That as much as we kind of function according to what this prescription is, then we begin to see it has an immediate effect in terms of how we are 
coping with the stress uh, which is experienced in the lockdown. And further, he says, having abandoned the attachment to the fruit of the action, ever content, depending on nothing, without expectation, self-control, abandoning all possessiveness, content with whatever comes, free from pairs of opposite and envy, even-minded in success and failure, he is not bound. So take each one of this and see how that is actually going to uh, help in terms of what I am experiencing. So again, kind of thinking about, uh, you know, how is that going to help me to cope with the lockdown and, and the coming darkness and how each one of these uh, instruction becomes part and parcel of daily practice. So the divine is to be known again in manifest and manifest forms, but the devotion uh, is related to the practice of karma yoga, of course, because dedication of actions is to, to God. And, and uh, uh, Krishna says, among all the yogis, he who is full of faith, with his inner self immersed in me, worships me, is according to me the most devout. So he is setting a benchmark in terms of, you know, what is to be the practice and how we are to approach the divinity. Fix your mind on me, be devoted to me, sacrifice to me, surrender to me, having thus united your whole self to me, take me as your supreme goal, you shall come to me. Now, coming to me is, of course, you know, the ultimate goal, but uh, these are practices, again, which, um, which are said to then uh, help one to cope with life and to build up one's resilience. So this is, uh, again, something, if you want to think about developing this inner resilience, this inner strength. And in, in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter number 12, Krishna gives uh, the characteristics of the devotee, uh, not hating any being, friendly and compassionate, free from attachment, egoism, balance in pleasure and pain, forgiving, contented, steady in meditation, self-control, tranquility, in other words, that you know, these are the um, what you call the the uh, inner strength. The inner strength, which uh, Krishna says, if you cultivate these qualities and characteristics within yourself, it gives you that enormous sense of inner resilience. And with that resilience comes the ability to cope with anything and to kind of, even if you're thrown in the worst situation, you come out of it very quickly because this resilience is provided by this inner strength. Okay, so going on to the path of knowledge then. Now learn from me how one has, who has achieved success then attains Brahman. He says, first of all, properly engaging with his purified intellect, controlling himself by his resolve, renouncing the objects of the senses such as sound, setting aside both hankering and aversion, and then going further, he says, living in a deserted place. Well, we, we are in lockdown. But deserted place doesn't mean, you know, going out into the desert. It means just finding a place by yourself for yourself, eating only small amount, regulating your diet, regulating your intake of food, regulating your speech and your body and your mind, constantly ded dedicating yourself to the yoga of meditation and maintaining a mood of renunciation and giving up egoism, physical power, pride, all these things which belong to the ego identity. And then reaching a state of inner peace. And then from there, having this uh, state of being that is Brahman. So this is the path of knowledge. Again, lots of kind of prescriptions as to what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is going to help us in the lockdown. And in chapter number six particular, because this is the yoga of meditation, Ashtang yoga, he gives us a whole, uh, you know, eight limbs which are given in the Bhagavad Gita. And this is what we can see is a holistic prescription of Ashtang Yoga, which is described in the Yoga Sutra. Uh, and, and this is a list of the do's and the don'ts and the asan, sitting posture, pranayam, pratyahar, dharana, dhyan, samadhi. And sometimes I kind of prescribe this to my clients and I say to them, okay, regulate your breathing in such a way that you are kind of sitting quietly and breathing in and out and centering yourself in your breathing. And what begins to happen? Immediate coping with the anxiety. These are some of the wonderful techniques which are given in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, which immediately has a, an, a, 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 an effect on 
on uh, on our uh, level of anxiety and and even it can help us to cope with uh, any any mental issues which are coming up because of the lockdown so then bringing us to the last section which is about the yoga sutra i know that we are running a bit uh, over the time but uh, here the yoga sutra describes the five states of the mind chipta agitated <clears throat> with chipta distracted and mood dull and sleepy now actually this is what we are going to be experiencing all throughout the lockdown agitation in the mind distraction about this that and the other all the time we are giving figures facts and figures about how many new cases are how many people are kind of sadly they are passing away because of this virus all this is bringing about a lot of agitation distraction in the mind there is a kind of depressive mood which then makes me to say oh, i don't want any of this thing and you know just kind of going and becoming disconnected with things and then the yoga sutra talks about this non yogic state as this uh, three and then it talks about the yogic state ekagra which is single point and, and niruda which is the arrested and still state of the mind and these are called the yogic state and they are achieved through meditation so meditation again is a key thing as far as dealing with or coping with this uh, consequences of lockdown is that some of these meditative exp uh, practices are so powerful in terms of dealing not only with day to day but in terms of long term developing the resilience which is what is uh, you know what is given to us in the in the yoga sutra so here's the logic uh, of of the yoga sutra it says the human condition is a subject to the tide of suffering uh you know suffering coming from external sources natural sources coming from inner sources and that is really i have to think about how can i um, you know get away from this relief from um from rebirth and suffering and the causes of suffering are the kleshas which yoga sutra describes as five in number uh, they are avidya raga dvesha uh, asmita and abhinivesha and these are ways in which i begin to experience life in a very kind of distracted very agitated anxiety filled way and these are the uh, the causes of my suffering and how to remove the causes by chitta vritti nirod stilling the mind making the mind to become peaceful and quiet through the practice of yoga and the method finally is one of meditation of samadhi kaivalya liberation so you can see that you know the yoga sutra as well as the bhagavad gita they have a comprehensive method of giving us techniques which are going to help us in coping with and also bringing about resilience within ourselves of the uh, you know the uh, the response to the lockdown okay so um what i just want to do if we, uh, if you don't mind that i will take about 5 minutes to just you know uh, do a simple meditation exercise um and and then then we can see how we can uh, we can experience this uh, in a in a little way in in this in this kind of way is that okay deepak is it okay to carry on uh, yes sir ramesh bhai please do thank you okay so if if everybody can just take up a comfortable posture and just close your eyes and just relaxed in your whole body just go through this relaxation process from the tips of your toes to the top of your head just close your eyes and become absolutely still wherever you are just take up a comfortable posture back and neck head in a straight line the body completely relaxed and you can scan the body to see if there is any tension which is there just relax the whole body nothing to do saturday afternoon just relax and just listen to this guided meditation relax and let go now just breathe normally in and out and just become aware of your breathing as you breathe in and out just become aware of your breathing as you're breathing in as you're breathing out and just become aware of the movement of the body the movement of the air in the nostrils in and out and just become aware of this breathing and take your focus just to the awareness of the breathing 
if the mind starts wandering about, just bring the focus back into the breathing and just concentrate on now the movement of the air as it moves in and out of the nostrils. So from the awareness of the whole breathing process, just narrow down your awareness to just the sensation in the nostrils of the air moving in and out. Just focus your attention, keep your attention just on the sensation of the air. This is a very narrow kind of area just around the nostrils or just within the nostrils where you can uh, feel the gentle movement of the air. Cool air coming in and warm air coming out. Just become totally aware of that sensation and fix your attention just on that sensation. And with the body relaxed, the mind starts becoming relaxed as you focus on that just one sensation. Just breathing in and out normally, focusing on the breathing, the sensation, and just being with that sensation and staying with it, gently breathing in and out, or nothing else to do but just focus on that sensation. And if the mind starts running away, just bring it back gently through the sensation and stay with it. Just stay with that sensation, breathing in, breathing out. And as, you, as the mind begins to focus and pay attention, just get a sense of this existence, this sense of being. Just the sense of being, I am here. I exist. Just the sense of being. This is called Asmita Samadhi. Just the sense of being, which is a sense of existence, your existence, which I am in, not becoming this, not becoming that. Just the sense of being. Just stay with that sense of being, breathing in, breathing out. And this sense of being is the core of your essence. It is the core of yourself. And it is beyond space, beyond time. And it is a sense of just being. And just stay with that sense of I am. And if you just stay with that sense of I am, experience the inner balance, the inner peace, the inner harmony. Just stay with that feeling of inner peace in that sense of being. Okay, let's conclude there. It's a very short exercise, but gives you an idea as to what to do, how to do it. And uh, it is something which anybody can practice in the moment, many times a day, and something which immediately brings about a sense of lowering of the anxiety, an experience of inner peace and harmony within oneself. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, I know it's uh, we run a bit over time, but I think, uh, you know, it's a it's, uh, very kind of detailed explanation about lockdown, about the days to come, where we know this kind of shortening of the days brings about uh, another layer of anxiety. Uh, thinking about, you know, meaning, means, sadhana, and how, uh, you know, the religious practices can bring about not only how to cope with life, but to develop this inner strength and this resilience which can help us to, uh, to deal with this current situation of the lockdown. So thank you very much. I'm going to just stop sharing the screen now.
And uh, over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Ramesh Pai. That was uh, um, a talk which I believe is uh, very relevant, as I said at the beginning, for those who have joined us late. Uh, welcome to the Leicester Friends uh, of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies talk today. Um, and uh, I hope you found this talk useful. So what I'd like to do is uh, we are going to take some questions over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, I would request uh, all those who wish to ask a question to either pen it in the chat box, or if you wish to ask it in person, then express your interest uh, again in the chat box and we will unmute you and uh, you can ask your question. What I'd like to do is kindly request all of you to keep your question brief to the point. We don't want to make it a conversation, please. Um, so I'm going to uh, kick off the proceedings by asking Ramesh Pai a couple of questions, if I may, Ramesh Pai, please. Uh, so uh, I think at the beginning of the talk, you said uh, human existence is about suffering. And I find this whole concept uh, quite uh, difficult to understand. So why is it about uh, suffering, Ramesh Pai? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Please. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is about suffering because, you know, this is something which uh, all of us experience one level or the other. You know, suffering is uh, an existential reality for us. Tell me one person in the world who has said, I am not suffering anything. I have never suffered and I'm never going to suffer. I am not suffering now. That is an impossibility, I think. And therefore, if we say that, you know, suffering is our existential reality, then that means that somehow or the other, we have to find ways and means of dealing with it. So that, uh, you know, if we, if we say, uh, how am I going to deal with anxiety? How am I going to deal with depression, which is inevitably going to come into my life? And if I'm able to have the mechanisms and the ways in which I can cope with it, that's fine, but you know, even some of these mechanisms actually break down because they are not adequate enough for us to, to, to deal with our intense anxiety or the kind of depression in which we then begin to, uh, to experience ourselves. <clears throat> so suffering is, is, is part and parcel of our life. This is the human condition. This is what, uh, you know, the, as I was saying, that all the religions in the world, they talk about suffering, even Buddhism, you know, it starts off with this concept of suffering. It says life is suffering, moment to moment is suffering, and it is going on throughout the life. And unless we are prepared to do something about it, it is going to keep on going on and on, okay? Um, so it is, it is part and parcel of our human condition and it is gonna be experienced. And uh, the thing is that we are looking for explanation as to why is it that I suffer. Okay. And we can bring it down to a physiological level and say it is an imbalance of this, that, and the other. We can say, no, it is a, a, a kind of uh, uh, explanation in the spiritual dimension that we are coming onto this planet in this human form. And this is really one way in which we can think about uh, the suffering is related to my for example, my karmic destiny and my experience in this, in this life uh, as to the kind of uh, stock of karma which I brought with me, my prarabdha karma, and therefore that is where I can think about suffering as a consequence of what I might have done in my past lives, which is expressing itself in the present moment. So we are looking for explanations of suffering and we are looking also for the kind of solutions to suffering. Okay, uh, does that uh, kind of uh, answer your question, Deepak? Yes, to a certain extent it does. It's, uh, it's always been a mystery. So can, can, I, can I be a bit more positive now, Ramesh Bhai, and uh, sure. move away from suffering and uh, ask my second question, if I may, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I really wanted to do is say, uh, ask you, can lockdown be an opportunity for yes. self-discovery and learning? 
yes. and uh, yes. eventually came earlier. Yeah, in fact, in fact, the you know some of the studies in the world which I, I've been reading about, you know, there are between twenty and twenty-five percent of the people who say this is a positive thing which is welcome in my life. Now, how is it that some people feel this is the worst time of my life, and there are people who say this is a welcome kind of uh, you know thing in my life? Somehow, they have found much more meaning in this kind of lockdown. And they have found ways of not only dealing with it, but also using it in creative ways in which they begin to kind of increase their sense of who they are, and also in a sense of increase their inner strength through this kind of lockdown. So it is not that everybody you know, is, is suffering in that way. There are a group of people who have taken this opportunity to, uh, to enable them to become even more resilient and even more uh, uh, to be having this kind of inner strength, whether it is through you know whatever means they're using, uh, it has come about that whether they are functioning at the at the physical level, at the at the mental level, or the spiritual level, somehow or the other they've found this opportunity to develop whatever they need to develop, and it is it is a welcome thing for them in their lives. So certainly it is not that everybody is experiencing in this in this kind of way. Of course, there may be a mixture of both these things, that there are certain things which we enjoy because of the lockdown, there are other things which we don't enjoy. Uh, and I was saying that, you know, the four dimensions of our existence, the physical, the personal, the relational, and the spiritual, all are affected in different ways. And therefore, uh, how we cope with each dimension Again, is a matter of you know whether I have the tools and techniques of doing that, or whether I do not, and whether I'm able to develop them uh, even in the lockdown, and how that can help me to cope with whatever is going on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a couple of written questions, uh, uh, Ramesh Pai, and uh, the first question I have here is from uh, Subrata De, uh, and the question is. Uh, can Vedanta help to cultivate acceptance and how can acceptance help during the lockdown? Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> acceptance means what? Acceptance means that there is a certain level of facing reality. So if you think about that, uh, you know, we are given some existential conditions and sometimes the distress comes about because we are not willing to accept the living reality. So think about how, when I am thrown in a situation and I don't accept that situation and I don't accept the reality of that situation, what happens? There is a kind of um, uh, rupture between what I'm experiencing and what the reality is. Now, as much as I begin to accept the reality which I'm confronted with, it allows a certain amount of opening for me to deal with that reality rather than to escape from it or to fight it. So as you know, that even, even if you think in terms of you know, you know, the flight and fight uh, uh, paradigm, whereby we say that you know, if once we are confronted with threat, we either tend to fight it in the way in which we know it, or we tend to uh, fly away from it, flight, fight, or freeze. We don't know what to do. Just like Arjun is uh, you know, in a state of freezing. He has frozen because he don't know where, where to move, how to move, what to do. But the fourth way is functioning, is that you are able to function because you are able to accept the reality, face the reality, and do something about it. So in that kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 mental way, that acceptance allows us to deal with life in a, in a realistic way. The spiritual way of thinking about it is, is this, is that if we think about, uh, you know, what uh, Krishna is telling Arjuna, is that, you know, uh, you have to think about surrender, sharnagati. And that means that one has to, think about how my relationship with the divine can make me to be able to surrender in such a way that that acceptance becomes part and parcel of my surrender. So surrender and acceptance 
in a spiritual sense go together and that allows one to be able to accept it. And the Vedantic way of understanding is, is what? Is that if I accept it in this kind of way in relationship to the divine, then it allows me to function in a different way. And this acceptance is about, um, uh, on the one hand, surrender, but also on the other hand, about facing reality and facing reality and also having that surrender as an attitude towards the divine helped me to decrease my anxiety and to cope with life as it is going on. So uh, a second question, which has come from uh, Pradeep Vasudevan here is, uh, what is the best path according to the Bhagavad Gita? Is it Jnana, Karma or Bhakti Yoga or a combination of all? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, 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 you know, the one way of thinking about this is that um, think about yourself in the sense that, you know, which orientation do you have? Are you a man of action, just like Arjun was a man of action? Are you a person who has got, uh, you know, this uh, emotional intelligence, as it were? Sensitivity to emotional condition within yourself. Think about whether you are intellectually, uh, you know, oriented. And that somehow can become the starting point of your own journey. Why? Because when you use something which you already have as a capacity, it makes that pathway to be easier for you. So if I'm intellectually aligned or oriented, it means that I can have that as the starting point of my journey, that intellectually I'm able to listen to things, to contemplate on things, to meditate on things, so shravanam mananam nitidyasan becomes, you know, a natural kind of way in which I can uh, do these things. So that's one way of thinking about it: is that uh, look at yourself, see what is your, you know, uppermost quality and the uh, uh, the the instrument which is most developed within yourself, and that becomes your starting point. The other way of thinking about it is to look at the spiritual journey, just like I was mentioning before, is that it starts with karma yoga and then it develops into uh, Jnana Yoga, and then Dhyana Yoga, according to the scheme which is given in the Bhagavad Gita. So you can follow that kind of sequential process, or you can follow the uh, kind of way in which we are uh, thinking about, uh, you know, what is my greatest quality, and how can I use that greatest quality in the service of my spiritual life? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um... So I think we have exhausted all the questions. Does anybody have any questions? If they do, please uh, uh, express your interest on chat and uh, we will ask you to turn your microphone on and ask the question. Can I request everybody to turn their videos on so we can see everybody it's, uh, during this period of lockdown? We'd like to see more people now if, if, if we could. Thank you, oh, that's lovely. Okay, that's excellent. Uh, we were only not asking you to do that to, uh, so that we didn't have any bandwidth issues during the talk by Ramesh Pai. So can I request everybody to turn their video on? And I can see a few familiar faces here. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it, even though I started uh, late, but it was useful. Okay, excellent. I'm glad to hear. So does anybody have a question? Deepak, there's a question from Anuradha. Okay. Uh, okay, so bear with me. I'm trying to find the questions. Okay. Uh, the question, bear with me. Uh, but my question is like uh, with the uh, new generation, the younger generation, it is difficult to convince sometimes the usefulness of our um, Vedanta and to get them involved in the activities. So Thank you. Yes, the question is how do we uh, convince the people uh, about the usefulness and introduction to Vedanta to the younger Thank generation? You. Thank you. Okay. For the people who right. don't want to learn. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's not an easy you know, thing which, which you're talking about. But what, what can be done, and this is what I do with my own uh, practice, 
uh, in, in, in counseling and psychotherapy is that you can convert some of these techniques and present them as if you know they've got nothing to do with uh, uh, with uh, religion in other words that these are mental techniques okay so it doesn't have to be labeled as vedanta i mean of course it is vedanta but you know you can say that here's a mental technique which you can use here's a physical technique which you can use to control your depression or to control your anxiety and here are ways in which uh, you know it can become effective for you now I would not say that, you know, don't tell them uh, to take any kind of medication because, of course, medication is important uh, for people who are not being, uh, you know, not able to cope. But taking the medication is a solution towards the long-term solution. You see what I mean? So that medication is a, not a long-term solution. The long-term solution is about changing, uh, you know, one's mindset, thinking about beliefs and attitudes which are giving rise to this depression or anxiety and trying to that obtain that inner transformation through whatever means. It doesn't have to be in, in the way in which we describe it, but certainly medication is a first step if it is required and then to kind of build on that in order for one to be able to uh, change this inner belief and attitude to, to begin to bring you into line so that you don't actually experience the distress which you are experiencing. Thank you, Ramesh Bhai. Uh, do we have any Thank you more very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, it seems like uh, uh, we have exhausted all the questions. So I would like to ask uh, uh, Raj Bhai Chauhan uh, to say a few words on behalf of the Leicester Friends of the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies and uh, we will conclude shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ramesh Bhai, if you are in the room, this is what you normally get. <laughs> Thank you for a fantastic, inspiring talk as usual, you know, and really is inspiring. As we are going through, you know, you can, the slides help because you can relate to a lot of those points. And I was pointing and Ramila and we were discussing this saying that applies to us and that applies to us and this is what we did. And it's great. So thank you. And, you know, it's nice to know that even we don't relate to all the points, but there were points that actually impacted us and affected us. That's right. And how we are applying them in these challenging times. So thank you for that. Um, also, <clears throat> looking at some of the faces, uh, now that they're all switched on, um, there's lots of new faces, and I'd like to talk a couple of minutes of your time to talk about the friends group and who we are. And um, majority of you know, for the people who actually don't know, we created the friends group in Leicester some 10 years ago, and a group of friends gathered because we value the quality of the level of speakers and the immense knowledge people like Dr. Ramesh Patni um, gave and um, benefited a lot of people without any charge or anything whatsoever. So this friends group has been going for over 10 years and we have a lot of friends group around the world now, small groups, one in Birmingham, one in Coventry, one in Dubai, India, etc. Um, but the whole aim of the friends group was not to create a group per se, but really to create a, a platform where people would be able to link to the work of the Expo, uh, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. And uh, we feel that a lot of people have benefited over the years through this uh, medium of the friends group. So, what I, and the other thing was to not only create awareness, but one of the things that was really, really desperate at the time when we created the group was um, to raise funds, uh, much needed funds for the Oxford Center who are doing incredible work. I mean, unless you actually get into it and find out a lot more, you'd find that there isn't another institution, a Hindu institution, that has access to some of this stuff in Oxford and uh, being able to research some, if you like, 
a very unique um, Vedic scriptures that are not accessible anywhere else in the world. So these are now being researched through your help. And with that in mind, without actually going on about it, I'd like to ask Dr. Ramesh Patni again, is there such a thing as Dani Yoga? As what? <laughs> Dani Yoga. Very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, uh, Dan is, uh, you know, one of the things which uh, Bhagwan uh, Krishna talks about in the Bhagavad Gita very much. And he says that, you know, there you are... You missed it out. Yes, that. yes. Yes, so everybody should practice uh, Dan Yoga. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in this unprecedented time, we all heard the word unprecedented. As you know, all, I uh, talk always ends on one word. So tonight I pick up the word unprecedented. Everybody is using unprecedented. What I'd like to do is put a twist on that and say, make done a precedent. That's yeah? right. So if you can, there are links on the chat line and it's not only about uh, donating money, it's about useful information, continued education courses that the OCVHS is providing and lots of other things on there. So please, do look at those and donate if you can, because it all goes to a good cause. And the Oxford Center, you know, in these times, they are still carrying on regardless. Fantastic. And uh, they're doing a fantastic job. So with that in mind, thank you so much. I, I'd like to wish all of you a very safe and happy Diwali and a very, very, very prosperous new year. So the more you get, the more you can give. Thank you. Namaste. 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 Okay, well, thank you, Raj. So it just leaves uh, for me uh, to thank uh, Ramesh Bhai on behalf of all the friends. And I'm delighted uh, to see so many uh, friends who joined us. Uh, and we, we, we still have about 63 participants who have uh, stayed with us. And uh, Okay, I'm, I'm just going to wish you all on, on, on again on behalf of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, a very happy Diwali and Nutan Varsha Binandan. Goodbye and take care and look after yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.